All right, this is a little thing I ran through. Uh, we'll give you this insulated copper. We're talking about this uh, uh, wires and stuff. And this is part of what you got to know anyway. If you don't know anything about wires, you're not going to be able to fix nothing. Uh, you might remember this account. Kind of, it's a cheap trailer plug install. It led to a $3,000 repair. Now, I had to strip the trim panels out of that car all the way up to replace this body wire harness because they used a scotch lock. A little bitty wire that was going back there that was only sufficient to feed the tail lights. And they scotch locked into it and put it feeding a bunch of lights on a trailer. And they drove all that. Well, they got to where they were going. They switched it off and the car kept running and the park lights wouldn't go off. And there's all kinds of problems. And so what happened was it started uh, heating that wire up, melting the insulation off of it, going back toward the power source. And it went all the way up into that harness, all the way across there to the dash and all that. And so... Basically, what we had here was we had, uh, you know, right about here is where they made their, their thing. See how the harness out goes over here? And it goes across right up here under the dash where I got it painted yellow. All that harness was destroyed. Now, this car was under warranty, but the guy had made his own problem. And uh, so we had to pull all the inside parts, had to pull the door panels off because the harness, it didn't have plug going out of the door, it actually went out into the door. Well, it's 95 Thunderbird, really a brand new uh, vehicle. And so that's why it's really important to understand how to use a trailer tow package. You install relays to carry the load. And uh, that was crazy. Well, the wires feeding the tail lights are like 22 gauge wire. And so that's the size of the copper conductor. It's a little teeny tiny wire, not very big, big enough to carry the tail lights, but not anything else. Uh, the thickness of a 22 gauge wire is 25 thousandths of an inch. About like that. The spark plug gap is about 40. See, it's littler than that. It's a little bitty wire. It's got felt like a tiny little wire to carry the lights of the car and the lights of the trailer. See how the different sizes of this wire is? Now, the current of wire can carry is totally dependent on gauge. 14 uh, American wire gauge can carry 20 amps, 12 gauge, 25, 12 gauge solid, you know, you got stranded and solid on that. 10 gauge, 30 amps, 8, 40 amps, 6 gauge, 55 amps, 2 gauge, 95 amps. And uh, 10 gauge, you're going to have 125 amps. I mean, one off, I'm not 10 gauge, duh. So, one off would be you got one off, two off, three off, the thicker the wire gets. You know, you're kind of going down like that. And so, metric gauges, notice, are millimeters. In other words, they're basically the thickness of the wire in millimeters. You got that? And so, your 20 gauge wire is going to be like a half a millimeter, 18 is 8. But you notice the numbers are opposite, the bigger the number goes. On a metric wire gauge, the bigger the wire is, and the bigger the number goes on a uh, American wire gauge wire, the smaller the wire is. So if you got 22 gauge wire, it's a little bitty wire. All right. So you burn this in so you won't burn things out. This comes from B plus on a relay from the existing light feed. See. Hey. Yay! Come here. Come here, girl. What's up? Can y'all get the car next Tuesday? Yeah. Do you want to in the morning or afternoon or? Okay, yeah, we'll make it happen. Next two. Tuesday, okay. Yes. All right. I'm going to put it on my calendar. Six, I think that's it. Yeah. Tell Stacy, or I mean, tell Deborah to call me when she gets the key. She may just drop by here. That's fine. That the conference is down there. Yeah, whatever works. She may leave it off. That works. All right, so zero degree, I mean, zero volt, that's a chassis ground. So you got to ground one side of the call. Uh, you're going to come from B plus, you're going to go out to your trailer lights, and you're going to come from your existing light feed. So when you turn on the lights, you want the lights to energize this coil, and you want this B plus to go down, go out to the trailer lights. Okay? Now, sometimes the extra load just cook the headlight switch. See how the headlight switch gets burned up like that? I don't know how many of them things I saw at the Ford place. People put them trailer lights on the running boards and all that kind of stuff. They find that brown wire going back to the tail lights, and they scotch lock into it. And they feed all them lights. They have they have lights on the cab. They have lights on. You've seen them things, and all that. See, they kind of like this right here. All them extra lights on there. And then they come back and say, "Hey, my tail lights don't work." And whenever I unplug the headlight switch, you know, the it it didn't blow the fuse. All it did was melt that connector and all that. And so basically, what I'd have to do is have to take care of that problem by uh, putting a new connector on it with a new you know pigtail and all that stuff in it. Of course, I could usually unlatch those, but I have to replace that one. New headlight switch. And so the factory did it on this truck whenever they were putting marker lamps on it, they'd have a trailer slash marker lamp relay. And 
And see, whenever you turned on the lights, you were energizing the relay. Then you had battery straight from power coming straight from the battery, and that would feed these marker lamps like that. Now, that is a 95 Explorer headlight story that I like to tell. Uh, this headlight switch right here on this Explorer looks like that, but it plugs wires plug in like that. And back in 1995, uh, there was a uh, well. I came to work here in 2001, and I got a call from an engineer in uh, Michigan, uh, and he says, "Do you remember in 1995 you fixed an Explorer that, that burned out the headlight switch on a long drive?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, I followed the warranty on that vehicle that you fixed, and it never has come back to give any more trouble, you know." And um, Anyway, he says, uh, let me see what Adam wants. Hey, Adam, what's up? A strut? Uh, let me see what I, let me see what I can let me see what I can find for you. I may have one. Okay, not a problem. But, uh, you need to borrow something from the other class over. But anyway, uh, so he says, uh, I've got to write a field fix for a bunch of cars that are burning out those headlight switches over in Europe. And I want to know what you did to fix that one because it never gave the trouble again. <laughs> and I'll show you what I said him. Uh, this is how I was wired up to begin with. See that? There's your headlamps and all that. Here's your headlight switch. And it cooked the wires right here. Right? So, well, basically, here's your headlight. Here's your dimmer switch. I'm sorry, it cooked the it destroyed the wires coming out of the headlight switch. Now, watch really carefully. I'm going to show you how I wired it up. You paying attention? All right. First thing I did was I cut that wire. You got it? Put a relay over here. I cut that wire. I connected that to the coil. Okay? Now, I sent this to the engineer. And I guess he published it for a field fix for those cars in Europe. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. Then I came off this other wire that I cut off of there, and so that's going out to here, right? And finally, I splice that into the switch, power feed. So basically, the, the fuse was feeding this. When you turned on this, it energized that relay, and it pulled and it put battery power straight out to the lights. You got it? Instead of this little crappy switch carrying the load, I had ins installed a relay. And the way that I did it, there was room in there behind that thing. I used a fuel pump relay, like it was a green fuel pump relay like we were using on those cars back then. And it had a little, uh, you know, tab on it where you could put it in and I mounted it right in there behind the headlight switch. And it looked like factory, the way that I had it mounted. So if you ever took it apart, you'd say, well, I didn't know these had a relay on them, you know. Well, anyway, I drew this same schematic and I sent it to that guy and he was really happy with that. But anyway, the point is, if you put a relay in there, I've actually fixed cooling fan modules like that. You know, cooling fan modules, some of the old tempo used to burn out. Because they had a relay built onto the board and it really had burned out. And I'd get a, a relay module that wasn't burned out, and I'd put a fuel pump relay piggybacked onto the board and wire it into the board on the inside so that when it energized the relay, it would energize that fuel pump relay. And then I'd have a relay I could change out separately instead of having to buy this whole thing. That's a long story. But anyway. You can have wire harnesses damaged by heat if they're laying too close to that EGR valve, like on that one there was. That particular wire right there was going out to the alternator on its Ford Focus, and it threw me a code. So whenever I got into there looking, I noticed that wire was laying in there too close, and it, this EGR valve gets blistering hot, and that harness wasn't rounded all, like it should have been. And somehow it got over there against that, and it had melted the plastic off, and so it burned it up, and that, that wasn't hard to fix. Uh, but you kind of got to know what you're looking for. That one ever damaged some too, by the way. You can have wires damaged by chafing. Believe it or not, that wire harness was laying over against that air conditioner line, and every time the engine torqued, it's doing this. And it gave it gives all kinds of problems, because you got a whole bunch of wires going through there, and they're short and out and everything, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and everything else is wrong. Then you can pinch them. When you're putting them back together, if you're not watching that where your harness is, you can pinch it. Look at that right. Yeah. All right, so pay close attention to harness routing. It's really important. Then you got installation issues. Well, some of them uh, old Ford Contours, uh, they had these cracked up, busted up insulation on those wires. And them wires, you get to touch one another in that wire harness. And there was a recall program, or actually the program that expired with miles in time, where we had to replace the entire wire harness under the hood on those cars with some that weren't cracked up like that. It was kind of poor 
you know, I don't know who, what, who the vendor was that the, the Japanese people got that harness from, but anyway. And now there's your little recall harness. Now, under hood wire harness, additional coverage. Under the location, 99, uh, 503, whatever it was. I actually remember one day whenever I went over there and Donnie was working on one, they had all kinds of electrical problems and they would always print one of these um, Oasis printouts over and he says, uh, man, we've got all kinds of voltages all over the place on this thing. I'm not sure what to do with it. And the, the, the ribbon on the dot matrix printer in the write-up area was about wore out, but I flipped it up and you just couldn't read it. I said, this has got one of those wire harness recalls on it. And he goes, well, why am I wasting my time? <laughs> so he went and got a wire harness for it, you know. But there's some other bend. If you've got a wire harness that bends, this right here, that lady just stepped in here, this was on her part. She got his Impala. And she said, I can't get it out of gear. It's in park all the time and I can't move it out of gear. I can't even drive the car. All right, so what's the first thing you got to do when you put it, put one in gear nowadays? When you crank it up, trying to put it in gear, what's the first thing you got to do? Press the brake. Put your foot on the brake. Listen to that man. Put your foot on the brake. There's a little solenoid in there supposed to release it. It's a shift interlock solenoid is what they call that. All right, this one here, had, uh, because that, that wire had been plugged in, and she'd gone back and forth in and out of park so many times it was bending the wires. You know what happens when you bend wires? You bend wires, bend wires, bend wires, and they're broke. Right? And so that, those wires are broke. Well, how do you fix that? Think about it. How are you going to fix it? This is what I do. I even had that picture up here, see? I'm going to take that right there, and I'm going to where that wire broke off, I'm going to spread them tabs and hang that insulator off there. And then I'm going to push that wire back up through there and lay it real tight against there. And then I'm going to, you know, pinch them back around where it'll stay there. you got to train that wire to lay it out real tight. Because if you make a big blob of a solder joint, it won't go back up in that connector. See, and you want it to be just like it was when it was new. And so you do that right way. You solder it up, do it the right way, it only works every time. That way you don't have to buy a bunch of stuff and all that. You can go ahead and get it fixed. And then I actually put it in there so that it would have a sort of a curly loop so that it wouldn't be doing this once you went in and out of the thing, you know, that had more of a springiness to it. So I worked it on that. And we saw this the other day, you know, the connections that are there to battery can have these uh, chalky stuff that gets in there. That's a really important ground. You remember that story? Was y'all in here the other day? Remember that one? The escort, transmission wouldn't shift, speedometer wouldn't work, and it was all about that ground. Now, current flow, that's the little thing I showed you that picture a couple of days ago. This right here is a blower resistor. And the blower resistor uh, on a lot of vehicles gets really hot. I mean, the current is flowing through there wherever there's a connection. It has a tendency to oxidize and start to develop resistance. And when you got resistance, you got heat. When you got heat, things start to oxidize more. Snowballs out of control. Next thing you know, the blower won't work. This one right here had melted out. This is a fan relay on a uh, Oldsmobile Silhouette, which was a van, and of course that was that fuse that was, and all of these, you might notice all these were fans. Now sometimes you'll have that on like a fuel pump. It'll basically start to build a little resistance and also be kind of watching for that because, you know, you got to figure out what's the best way to fix it once you've found it too. Typically you replace the pigtail and the uh, connector on those blower resistors under the dash, and then, like I say, if you get under there and you're fooling around with them wires, you see that blower coming and going, you know, before fusion is pretty bad to do that too. This is what it looks like you spill toner on your desk. <laughs> I don't even remember how that happened, but it got away from me. Poof. Well, that black powder is all I basically had to do is get in the vacuum cleaner and suck it off of there. But it looked terrible. As soon as that happened, it's like, you ever do something like that about the time it happens, you say, man, it don't get any worse than this. This is terrible. Wasn't well, that bad, really. That was a little surprise slide there. Butt connectors. Who's used butt connectors before? All right, now butt connectors are really, you know, you stick it in, you pinch it on both sides, you know. Uh, those kind right there are really crappy. They don't use them last very long. One time there was a guy that had uh, worked on his plastic surgeon's Jeep over there uh, at some tent shop, and they had put some uh, anti-theft system on it. And they just basically crammed the wires off up into there, and one of the things they had to do was cut a wire going to the ignition switch, and put it together with a big yellow butt connector like that. And he was talking about it bucking and jumping, and he brought it in for warranty repairs. And I could grab the wire and just pull it out of that butt connector. It was dancing around, losing its connection and all. And so uh, I just kind of put it back together, and I told the guy, I said, whoever put this on didn't do it right. And uh, so the guy that owned the tent shop came over there, and I said, why, why do you have all of these wires 
stuffed up under the dash of this brand new Jeep. It looks like a witch's hair or something. It's just terrible. And he said, well, you know, I said, you're supposed to run those through a loom and, you know, tie wrap them off and all that. And he said, well, if you do that, you get into bending wires and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, one way or another, he actually cut the wire to see if it would kill the vehicle, and it did. Because he was trying to see if we would, you know, up and up. But these right here, you might see these little translucent on there. If you take those right there, you need, it's good to tin the wire with some solder, stick it up in there, and you bite that really good and hard so you know what's there, and then you heat that with a heat gun or your lighter, and it sucks down and it seals it against oxidation and everything. These aren't all that bad, although I don't like the way they look, and I'd a whole lot rather not use any of these at all if you're going to go very far on it. You know, of course, people use them all the time. Uh, I showed this one guy about solder and heat shrink, and he said the first thing I did was went home and I did my, you know, his big bumping, thumping radio you guys like to have in the back. <laughs> he actually took all of that stuff loose and he soldered and heat shrinked all his connections instead of using the silly butt connectors. He says, it cleaned up my sound like I couldn't believe, man. Because mm -hmm. they was dancing, you know, dancing around scratching and all that kind of stuff. All right, wire harness overlays and routing are really important. Whenever a short or an open is hidden somewhere on a wire, you don't have to follow that wire all the way to find where that short is or where that open is. All you got to do if it's a short, Snip, snip, cut that wire out, get you some shrink tubing, I mean, I'm sorry, shrink tubing and some loom, and run it over like, route it so it's out of the way, and it don't, you don't want it getting wrapped around a fan or getting laid against a manifold and all that. And that doesn't take very long. If you know it starts from here and goes to there, just run another wire, man. It don't take very long to do that. Now, you got to pay attention. If it's branching off going a bunch of different places, you got to watch out for that. But on the other one, the fixing that, you can see right here. See how you can follow that harness over. All right. Now then, this one here was a quitter. Wouldn't restart. Had no start, park, no fuel injection. This belonged to a retired FBI guy that had a bonding agency, and sometimes he would uh, go with the police and chase bad guys. You know, bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do when they come for you and all that stuff? You know. <laughs> uh, my phone will not shut up. Hey, Deborah, what's up? Yeah, it's an engine. It was supposed to go to Geneva. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. She was about to say that in the wrong place. Okay. This guy right here, you got an integrated relay control module. It's got a bunch of relays in it. This isn't one of those where you can't replace the relay. You just got to replace the whole thing. And power train control module, ignition control module. On this one here, you had that EDIS system, which was an electronic distributor this ignition system that was a sort of a, of a sedge way between the older kind of ignition system like the TFI and when, it, when they started putting it in the engine controller. Uh, but this thing is, it is with a no start, like that. And so what I did was I did a diagnosis with the SDS machine that showed an open circuit on this wire right here. Now that wire right there was in this flat loom that went over the top of the shock tower from the module in there to the PCM. Also, you might notice that um, on uh, these, this wire right here, how it's got foil around it on that crank sensor wire right there. It's got some foil around it and that foil is grounded as a shielded wire. It shows on there, see how this dotted cylinder looking thing is around there like this? That is going to be a grounded shield. See how it's grounded right there? And that prevents interference, electromagnetic interference from other places from getting in there. Uh, but anyway, I had to unwrap all that foil. I actually, uh, whenever I got that SBDS machine hooked up, the way they had it fed up, it, it would help you find something like this. And I could find it, had on the machine, whenever I would wiggle it, it would show me a symbol that it was open. And so I'd move it and it'd be open. I'd move it and close. Open, open, close, open, close. So this one wire right here is what the problem is. And I took it loose from the engine controller, and I took it loose from there, and I opened up that uh, uh, loom on, the, on top of the shop tower, and I unwrapped the tape off of it, that silver tape. I was going to need to put it back on there. And then I took my, uh, the wire and I had it in my hand. I had a connector on each end. It was a wire about that long. And I could not find anything wrong with that wire. But that PIP sensor is a really important, that's your crank reference on that one. 
And, and it comes, you know, you notice the crank sensor was wired into there, right there. So I says, I'm going to uh, replace this wire. So I got some of the right kind of connectors and I replaced the wire. And uh, this one right here. Now I remember, this is what's odd to me. When you look this up now, that, that sensor, I mean, that uh, EDIS went right here. I remember it being down here. But now, I have slept since then. I could have forgot. But I do know that it was a wire between the engine controller, which was back here inside the car, and also uh, that thing out here. But anyway. And this is how it looks. So that's the EDIS module right there. You got two coils there. This is the 4.6, and the crank sensor talks to that one, and then the heat, heat module. That, that's wire right there. You the want it with a problem. See if that wire right there is in two places or is not working right, and ain't gonna do so. Right here, this looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? Does that look complicated to you? That's called a block wiring diagram. What they call that. This kind of tells you. All right. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna simplify this. One wire at a time, guys. Figure it out. That's the only wire we care anything about. That one wire is the only one we care anything about. The one going from that through that shield. Over here, see how they drew the shield on that one? And it went to that pin right there. For that particular pin, you got to make darn sure you're on the right one in the gray orange. And that pin right there. And I went ahead. And, and this is where it was, right in here. See that module? It was going through here, and the engine controller is back in there inside the dash. And this is what the module looks like when it's just laying there. I replaced that harness from the EDIS module to PCM. Started up. He never had any more trouble. I could not find anything wrong with that wire. I don't know how many times I've seen that where there's something going on, where a wire is deflected voltage or whatever. You think it's got to be touching ground somewhere. Sometimes the wire just is a bad wire. I could hook my meter to it. Couldn't find nothing wrong with it. It's probably this one on that truck. And see, I was manipulating the harness right in this area. So I wasn't moving it here, and I wasn't moving it in there, but I was just moving that, you know, I had popped that cover off, I could get that wire, and I could bend it in that one spot. Not disturbing it anywhere else. And that connection would come and go. And that was the reason it wasn't starting. Know your wiring. Know the right way to fix it. Wiring harnesses are built one wire at a time. That one right there, that was wired up one wire at a time. It's like that fan thing over there. We fix them one wire at a time. You got that? So what do you know that you didn't know before? It's wire. Yeah. This ain't really all that complicated if you think one wire at a time. You just got to know which wire is doing what. You know, that's pretty simple. End of story. I got a question. All right. Okay, say like, um... Your car, it keep going dead. Mm -hmm. And um, that usually means there's something wrong with it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> we we know that there's a problem. Yeah. So find out is because like at first I had to move the cable to like actually get it to jump, and like I move the cable whatever it it jump. So then like it started not doing that. You couldn't. You talking about loose battery terminals? No, I'm talking about like, okay, the terminal not loose, but the cable, for some reason, like, you just got to move that and it'll, it'll crank up. Mm -hmm. So then, like, it stopped doing that. It stopped being able to move that and crank up. You feel me? So so moving it didn't help anymore. Yeah, so yeah. I took the battery out. I put a whole new battery in, and now it's back to you can move the cable. And it, it'll crank up. That is going to be a cable issue. And you know, when it's not cranking, you need to be doing a voltage drop test. Right? Oh, what yeah. about like, okay, when you know how the cable comes to the. Um, What's that on that on that Mazda pickup? Or? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, the, ca the positive cable. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know how the wires connected to the bolt? Mm -hmm. On the starter? Or on, the, on the starter? Or on the, no, I'm talking about on the on the actual battery. Okay, you're moving you're moving the negative cable or the positive cable. The positive. Okay. And it's it's like it's not all the way connected. Like you know how the wire be connected around the bolt. Mm -hmm. It's it's not connected. It's just like I don't know. I have to show you it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that typically, if you you know fix that cable like it's supposed to be, where it's got a good solid connection and it's good and tight, and it you tighten it up in there. Ain't that the same thing as wrong with that Bobcat booster? Um, yeah, the well, the truck that we had to do, we had to, uh, what's called, we had to change our cable. Yeah, we had to like make a whole new cable. 
Yeah, yeah, that's, that would be what you would need to do. Going to get a, you mean, or put another end on that cable, is what I would say. It shouldn't be too hard to figure out uh, that one out, though. But I mean, that's what voltage drop tests about. If you go from a positive battery terminal to the hot place on the starter, and you try to make some current flow, if you're reading 12 volts there, you know, then you know you, you're dropping all the voltage there, and then you can track down where it goes. But you've got uh, you got a battery cable issue on that one. What that is, and that would, like I say, wouldn't be hard to fix. Probably wouldn't cost that much. Make Vicky really happy. Nick done fixed his truck.